Welcome to the Fearless Faith Radio Show, which follows me, Mary Grothy, and my path as a Christian executive in corporate America. I share the highs and lows, provide scripture and teaching, and then interview influential guests who are walking the talk. I aim to help fill the discipleship gap for Christians in the workplace by creating powerful and real weekly lessons we can all learn from and implement. Welcome to the Fearless Faith Radio Show. I'm your host, Mary Grothy, and today I'm joined by a very longtime friend. This is going to be an amazing episode. My friend, Brent Hines, welcome to the show. Hey, good to be here. Okay, Brent is the executive director at the Foundation for Financial Wellness. He also is a man of many projects. We've known each other for years. Brent was so kind to me as a budding entrepreneur. Oh gosh, how long ago? I don't know, 12, 13 years ago. And I had a vision stepping out into my own to run my own company. And I was introduced to Brent through a mutual connection. And I learned about what they were doing at FFW. And I thought, you know, hey, I'm starting out on my own, starting my first company. And didn't really know what I was in my first company, but Brent's like, I have a need. I need these people to be called. I need this program to be introduced to employers and to financial advisors. I need to get financial advisors certified to provide this wellness education to through employers to their employees. And I was totally on board because I grew up in like such a poverty mindset. We were always without, we had nothing. We were broke and we had to hear about it every single day. I have these vivid memories of my mom looking in the back of her credit card for the phone number because you didn't have like the internet back then. So she'd have to call and learn what the balance on the credit card was just to know if we were going to be able to order a pizza for dinner or not. Um, It was just constant memories of like, we don't have enough. So on that note, I, when I started to make money as a 15 year old and starting to accumulate as much wealth as I could and support myself and take care of myself, I had like a good sense, but it was literally just don't become your parents. <laughs> so, but I didn't have any financial education, any financial literacy, any understanding of how money worked. It wasn't until I got my first corporate job when I was 22 and the manager sat me down and helped me understand what retirement was, was a, what was a 401k, what it meant to have emergency savings. And I was only making about 29,000 a year at that point, but I was able to start saving and putting away for retirement. And it's unbelievable what then transpired, getting educated on things like life insurance and whole life policies and building wealth in other ways and getting into tax strategies and diversifying the way that you're building wealth in your portfolio. And so I had all this education and literacy coming into me. But what I never really understood was the impact that when people are financially um, illiterate or uneducated or they're struggling is how badly it impacts their health Mm -hmm. and their well-being. And it creates stress. It creates strife between a husband and a wife. It can tear apart a home. It can tear apart relationships with, with siblings or parents or other people in the family. There's this massive destructive nature when people are financially unwell. And so when I came into the Foundation for Financial Wellness, all of a sudden the light bulb went off for me, like these things are directly impacting each other. And that's when my passion level skyrocketed. So Brett and I have been on this super crazy journey Yeah. for the last, I don't know, 12 years, or, I don't know, 12, 12 years. Yeah. yeah. And he's going to share his background and story. I just gave you a glimpse into mine and my understanding of financial wellness and why it's important, but this guy lives and breathes this. And I want you to hear his story. He's going to grace us with that. It's super powerful. He's a keynote speaker, soon to be author, like he has a story and I'm so excited that he's here with us today to share that with you. And then we're going to learn about the work you are doing today and how people can get involved in that. And of course, at the end of the show, you know, we're going to ask you your advice for our audience on how to have fearless faith. So Brent, I'm, I'm shutting it. So (laughs) let's learn about you. I can't wait to have your story shared with the audience. Yeah. Well, all I can be is authentic, um, and learned, um, somewhere kind of mid career, that um, transparency and authenticity, <laughs> um, there's strength in that. Yeah. It's the opposite of vulnerable, uh, which is counterintuitive, <laughs> right? Because sure. before you try it, you're like, well, no, I don't want people to know all my, all my scars, right? all my, my weaknesses. All, they're not going to want to do business with me if they know that I struggle with this or that. And, exactly. And then you realize sometimes if you're, if you're smart enough or mature enough, you'll go there on your own, but... <laughs> Or, or you're like me and it takes falling on your face and starting over. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I hear redemption stories are in 
in high demand. Yeah, so. they are. So let's hear it. <laughs> Well, I don't know. Uh, let's see. I don't want to treat you like my therapist. How far back to go? Um, I grew up poor as well. Um, have two parents who um, I'm blessed to have them. They love me dearly and uh-huh. they gave me everything. And we were financially illiterate. <laughs> <laughs> Very blue collar. Uh, dad worked. Uh, I'm, I'm a native Texan. Um, roots in the Houston area. And dad worked at uh, DuPont turning a wrench mm-hmm. in the hundred degree heat, ninety percent humidity. Yikes. He's um, he, he was a uh, uh, airborne ranger in Vietnam. So uh, parents divorce. Mm-hmm. Um, Mom and I get in the car, and we have family that lives in this little town in the middle of nowhere in Colorado called Castle Rock. What? Yeah. You mean like where we're sitting right now? Yeah, this fancy neighborhood that we're in now. This wasn't here in 1985. <laughs> no, this was the meadows, like literal Literally meadows. Literally the meadows, yes. yeah. There were deer and elk and bears and, you know, and sure. pasture. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, mom and I came here literally, I, it was like almost literally on her last tank of gas in a beat up car and we're pulling a U-Haul tiny little trailer that you couldn't go over 45 miles an hour. It took us three <laughs> days to drive here. It should take like 12 or 13 hours. Today, yeah. Like, yeah. Nice three car. days later. <laughs> yeah. Literally like <laughs> we roll into town. Like, I don't know, like this, I don't know. Uh, like the Beverly Hillbillies probably. <laughs> Um, mom is doing everything she can. Like, I think she had $40 left. She had two twenties. And one of the first people I meet when we get into town is, um, the youth football coach. And it was $40 to register. And then if you bought used wow. equipment, you can get it all for 40 bucks. So she, li- I literally, my memory is watching her not say a thing, took the last 20, two twenties out of her wallet for me mm. to play football. Cause we got here. Um, oh, but it, it, let me. <laughs> yeah, it, it's it, uh, it's it's a mother's love. Yes. Um, and terrible decision making. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, you could play football, but yeah. you can't eat. Yeah, no so. pads. No, I need that other twenty. <laughs> so I remember, like my cousin. Like so, we moved in with my aunt and uncle here, and my two cousins who are like two of my favorite people. So I kind of mm. been all of a sudden have two siblings now, and um, I'm still in great. My dad loves my aunt and uncle as well. So it was like, it was this really cool family ecosystem, but yeah. mom and I were struggling and, um, it turned into more of a partnership. Mm-hmm. So in fifth grade, you shouldn't be a business partner with your mom. Come to find out. <laughs> um, that's, Come on. That's not the healthiest of relationships. So her and I, um, you know, we're bouncing around. We lived in my aunt and uncle's basement, I think for the first year or so, um, then could afford an apartment, not a great one. Um, and then a rental home and then back to another apartment. And you know how that goes. Yeah. Um, your memory of your mom calling the number on the back of the credit card. My memory is at 12 years old, I learned how to float a check. Um, and wow. nobody knows what a check is, much less how to float it today. <laughs> <laughs> right. So you like put it in water and watched it float. That's right. Yeah. Okay, yeah okay. Right down the drain, actually. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Literally <laughs> metaphorically, however, uh, so yeah, we were picking up some really bad habits, but it was out of survival. Mm-mm. And so I grew, I, I grew up not knowing I've never played the game, not being behind. Yeah. I'm always playing from behind. Like I've never had a lead. <sighs> right. So this isn't poor me. It's just, um, I think Big. a huge percentage of people in this country, the wealthiest country on earth live that way. Mm-hmm. And in, in hindsight, now with the work that we do, our three pillars um, have to do with, uh, I love the methodology Be Do Have. A mutual yeah. friend of ours, John Wittry, uh, executive coach, introduced me to Be Do Have. And I began overlaying Be Do Have on top of our personal finances. Mm-hmm. So if you go to the end mode, like anything having to do with finance or financial education, financial literacy, mm-hmm. tends to go straight to the have. But yeah. The knowledge, the know-how, the yeah. X's and O's, the nuts and bolts sure. of how money works. Very textbook. That's yeah. right. Um, however, if having the, the the education or the knowledge was enough, we have the answer to every money question imaginable and right. literally in the palm of our hands today. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But but we're in worse shape financially, personally, as families, as communities, as a nation. Ooh, don't even get me. But right. Started. So have is great. That's got to be part of the formula, but we got to go back to be, do, have, go back to doing. Doing is the behaviors, Mm -hmm. right? So what are the behaviors when it comes to money? 
And, and we, through the years, have found this model to be very like digestible of mm-hmm. there's three types of, there's th- three flavors of behavior. Okay. Three flavors. <laughs> three flavors of behavior. <laughs> Say that five times. There are good behaviors. Mm-hmm. There's bad behaviors. Mm-hmm. And then the most dangerous are the missing behaviors. <laughs> the ones you don't do. That's right. You don't know mm-hmm. what you don't know. And that I think back to my mom and I and illiteracy was impacting us. Ignorance, which is something very specific. That's not dumb. Mm-hmm. That's not stupid. It's just ignorant. Right. I'm ignorant of all kinds of things today. Right. Yeah. right? Like we drove, I drove past the hospital. How many things in there am I ignorant about? Like, I don't pretend to know those things. Correct. Right. Yeah. Uh, not comparing a surgeon to a financial planner, but um, yeah, I don't think ignorance is necessarily a bad thing, especially yeah. if there's an awareness around it. Like, Hey, I, d- I know there's things here. I don't know. <laughs> um, and what drives behaviors go back to B. Mm-hmm. B do have being would be psychologists would call you the scripts or tapes or records around your relationship with money. Yeah. And when that one day kind of fell out of my mouth, when I was talking to a group, your relationship with money, it sounded kind of strange, but it made perfect sense to like all of us. Like I do have a relationship with money. Yeah. Is it healthy? Is it empowering? Is it a mindset of abundance? Is it a mindset of scarcity? Are you playing from behind before you even start? Can I add something on that? Uh, yeah. Like we talked about this uh, two weeks ago on the show. Are you worshiping money? And I think taking it into the faith sense, uh, we had a guest, her name was Sarah Dumas, and she's uh, the money coach, but <laughs> woman of faith. She has done so much in strategic fi- uh, CFO consulting mm-hmm. and then currently helps predominantly women entrepreneurs that are looking to go from six figures to seven figures. And there's so much that has to be rewired, but bringing it into what the Bible says about money and where I had to rewire and I'm still rewiring so many of my belief systems is for how many years was it ingrained? So zero to 15 until I started earning money Mm -hmm. that it, it was, we never had enough. We were always without And it was the love of money was the root of all evil in our household because it was the love of it, the fact that we didn't have it, the worshiping of it and the constant talking about it. There wasn't a day that went by that we weren't having conversations where we weren't paying, we weren't paying money in a good light. You know, it was, everything was about being without and the scarcity mindset and woe is me and they have, and we don't. And so it was like demonizing almost money or the lack thereof. So then the opposite of that is we should worship when we do have it. And so then going into the next stage, age 15 to 29. So this is when I started earning until I met Christ. (laughs) Money was my God and as much as I could have of it and as successful as I could be and as much earnings as I could have and as much as I could spend and buy my friends rounds at the bar and show and prove and I am righteous and I'm amazing because look at all this money I have and it tied into this worth. So it's so much more, I think too, just how demonic, like the love of money can be. And then Sarah had said a couple of weeks ago that how do you know if you're worshiping money? Like how how do you know if it's a God in your life? Like when you wake up, are you thinking about your job and earnings and money and the bills and the trip and the, like, is your motivation and the work you're doing for the day about performance and earning and money and, and what's on the horizon and um, for your work and money and in your earnings and all of this. And then what can come from that? I know I have this event coming up and we're looking at this vacation or we need to do this, or I need to pay my rent or my bills. Like if that is where your focus is, holy moly, it's going to consume you and your well being. And so she was walking us through this shift of like, if your eyes are on Jesus and your eyes are on the, the promise of God of what he has said in providing for us, and we put our focus there and we're worshiping him, the rest can come. However, the Lord calls us to enter a partnership with him and to do good works. And we don't just get to exist and be, and he's just going to like write a check every month just for existing, right? He calls us to enter into work with him and providing. And there's so much in the Bible about contributing and doing hard works and, and being blessed in that. And so it's interesting from a belief system standpoint, I just felt I had to interject because yeah. I feel like it goes so much deeper than um, some of the items that you just shared, but what you shared was very powerful. So please continue. Yeah, there is this, you know, being the hands and feet. Um, and it, it all starts 
and the six inches between our ears, uh, uh, yeah. all that relationship. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, I mean, biblically speaking, Jesus spoke more times about money than he did about kingdom. Money is mentioned that. numerically counting. He mentioned money more times than he did his kingdom. Wow. And wow. I, don't know, I, I should do this research. What percentage of the time he mentioned money was it in a um, <laughs> beware? Mm-hmm. Like it's a th- we're going to barter, mm-hmm. we're, like we trade, right? So whatever that currency is, um, he warned and warned and warned uh, us. Um, that's where the love of money is the root of all evil. Yes, right. Came from, so, yeah. Um, Sorry, I derailed you. Yeah, but that's a. We really- do have <laughs> belief systems. <laughs> yes, we do, and and I re- I recognize that we don't have it. Must be nice. Um, well, I couldn't, I, you know, I couldn't afford his taxes, you know, all those statements. Mm-hmm. Um, and we're really, really careful. Like we do, we have a lot of like coaching concepts that bleed into our work at the foundation, a lot of counseling concepts mm-hmm. that bleed into our, um, so one of our beliefs is that like really guard your thoughts because, um, h- how we feel is a choice. What we think is a choice and thoughts turn into words and words turn into behaviors. And now we're back to our be do have yeah. again. So yeah, That's like good. feed those receptors in the brain with, with healthy thoughts mm-hmm. and healthy words. I'm saying pretend like, let's not, we can't pretend that the wolf's not at the door. We can't pretend that there's more money in our account. Um, but goodness, like, w- like to sit there and wallow in it, yeah. Right. Um, and then leading towards that worship of money or then the demonization of, of yeah. it. Right. I, I, I get it. I, I appreciate that. To fast forward, I, I had much of the same um, mindset as you. I probably wasn't as much of a go getter as you if our youth is anything like our adult years. Um, <laughs> but as a kid, because my mom and I were in partnership helping pay for things and um, I began working at a really, really young age. As well, one thing I knew to do, we grew up blue collar. I knew, well, first and foremost, I know how to mow. Hey. Yeah. I know how to trim and <laughs> and I can sweep. And and um, I uh, before I could drive, I pulled around in a cart um, in our neighborhood. And and uh, I went to, uh, at, in those years, uh, Sears and Roebuck was a, a big deal. Mm-hmm. And my uncle, whose home we moved into, was a big uh, craftsman uh, tools guy. Mm-hmm. So the thing I, the only thing I knew to do was, um, I, I got a ride to Sears at a uh, um, a mall called South Glen. Yeah, there was no there was no interstate to get there. You had to go <laughs> over uh, the the big hills on County Line Road yeah. to, to get there. Right, uh, <laughs> like like the, the roller coaster ride. I saw a video on that. I got someone put it on Facebook or Instagram the other day, and the hills of County Line. And yeah. I I've only heard it. I'm I'm not a native. I mean, I moved out to Colorado in '98, but I lived in Boulder. And so, but my husband is a native and they live down in that area. And so they, I've heard them talk about these stories of the hills on County Line Road. And, yeah. and I finally saw a video, like somebody actually had a video of it. And I was like, how was that legal? You really, you literally like, lose your was, stomach. Like, it was yes. a roller coaster. It was a roller coaster. I was shocked. So, anyway. Yeah. Okay. So as South kids Glen in the Mall. back, we would look forward to the hill, you <laughs> of know. Of course. Yeah. Of course. I'm so, sure. This is so funny. I, I don't think you're bringing back memories. Um, my aunt and uncle would put us in. The truck and on <laughs> on Fridays we would like drive. in the back or the seat. Somet- hey, yeah, n- no judgment, but yeah, well, I spent plenty of time in the bed of a truck. Really safe. Um, we'd go to South Glen on Fridays when my uncle would get off of work. We'd all get in the truck and we'd go to South Glen to have dinner at the cafeteria. <laughs> That make- was such a treat, though. Like, <laughs> did eat- they have Panda Express back then? No, Sparrow Pizza called, or like was it called Furs or Luby's? <laughs> One of the two. Um, oh my gosh. Anyway, so we'd go eat dinner there, and I'm like, we'd walk through the line. I'd be like, I can pick as many as I want. Yeah. Like, um, so, and then we would oh. leave Luby's, and then we'd walk down the mall, making our way. It was like window shopping down to Sears and Roebuck. So I would have these dreams of when I was an adult, I was going to have all these this big toolbox and these beautiful tools and that's where oh. I was going to buy my tires and I was going to bring my, my new fancy truck someday down there to get, you know, like, Sounds I just, like a dream I never had, but <laughs> go on. That was my dream. So long story short, <laughs> when it came time to make money, 
uh, I knew I wanted to make money. I was probably somewhere around that 15 years old. Mm -hmm. Um, I went to Sears and bought my own lawnmower and bought it on credit Oh, oh. without a cosigner. They gave a 15 year old. They let me make. You must have looked really reliable. (laughs) I just, it was different. It was different world then. Right. So, um, yeah, I still have that mower today. Um, just because I can't get rid of it. Oh my gosh. Is it vintage? I Uh, mean, it's perfectly maintained (laughs) blade sharp. I don't use it anymore, but I can't get rid of it. I'm sure. Smart plugs are clean. Oh, it would fire up first pull. Oh yeah. So I'm sure that's just probably some like biblical worshiping of a lawnmower. That I, just, I should probably let go of but um, Your idol is in the garage. <laughs> my idol is the one pull mower. So yeah, no. Um, but what changed my life in those days, Mary, was um, I, I would, I knew the neighborhood pretty well because I'd walked it and mowed it. And um, mm-hmm. I was riding my bike one day, like my, you know, Schwinn kind of bike, like dirt bike. And um, I go past a garage sale and I wasn't 16 yet because I was still riding a bike around the neighborhood. Um, and I pulled into this garage sale. What's a 15 year old doing at a garage sale? Like, Oh, I need some, could use some pots and pans or some tools. Camping Come on. Were they selling yeah. tools? Uh, first and foremost, is there any craftsmen here? No. Okay. <laughs> well then, uh, and I tripped across, it was a, uh, briefcase, hard briefcase back in those days. It was like a, yeah. you know what I mean? Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Side, like legit side. that you see yep. in the movies mm-hmm. and it looks, it's fake leather. It's pleather, yeah. you mm-hmm. know? Um, and it was brown. Remember and a uh, brown handle mm-hmm. and I like pick it up and open it up on their little fold out table and it is full. It's a, it's made for in, it had an insert made for cassette tapes and wow. inside it was full of cassette tapes of some old guy named Zig Ziglar. Oh, no way. Yeah. So I feel like I haven't heard this story and I've known you for so long. <laughs> So at 15 years old, I buy you Zig Ziglar tapes in a briefcase with cash, of course. Um, and I go riding home, you know, you had to pump uphill with in one hand on the steering mm-hmm. wheel and holding the, I couldn't wait to get. And uh, a few Christmases prior, my mom and dad, Santa, I mean, um, gave me a, a stereo and it had a cassette player in it. Mm-hmm. So I go in the, you know, I, I live down in the unfinished basement thing. It's kind of my domain down there. And um, I started listening to Zig. And Zig had a Southern accent. We're mm-hmm. from Texas. Um, he so grew like up him? poorer than we did <laughs> from his stories. At a 15 year old, I'm absorbing. I can't get enough. Wow. And I'm binge listening to him. <laughs> and then in the basement, here's the weirdest part of the whole story. Most kids are pretending to be rock stars, mm-hmm. like air guitars and singing sure, karaoke sure. with whoever, Bon Jovi or, mm-hmm. right, or whoever what it was at the doing? time. I'm pretending to be Zig. I would, I had his tapes memorized so I could tell the story about the redhead. I could tell the story about getting stuck in the squat. Mm -hmm. I would tell the story about, uh, uh, I grew up, we were poor, but we had enough. I knew we had enough because every time I'd reach for seconds at the table, my mom would slap my hand and say, you've had enough. Like Mm -hmm. I could tell the joke the way Zig told it. And, um, he was like this lifeline for me. It was the first view of, I could get out of here mm-hmm. um, without winning the lottery or wow. inheriting a, you know millions of dollars. There's a path out, mm-hmm. and he was the first path that I mm-hmm. that I saw and could recognize. So um, yeah, uh, that's where this weird I think life of speaking and coaching and building programs for people. Mm-hmm. As cliche as it could it get more cliche than Zig Ziglar, but that's amazing. So when I was 22 and working my district sales administration job for the payroll company, Paychex, I knew I wanted to get into sales. And I had this desire mostly because as part of my paper pushing activities, Mm -hmm. one of the papers I was pushing was a commission report. And you actually know whose it was. (laughs) Funny. You saw some zeros there. I saw Yes. The mutual connection who introduced us, it was her commission report that I saw. She was a a top five rep at the time. She was making more in one check than I was going to make in my entire annual salary. And I, this job already was helping to change my life and pull me out of the the sin and hell I was living in. Just create a different kind of hell on the other side of the other hell that I was on until I met Christ. Yeah. Different flavor of hell. But 
I remember thinking, how do I get that role? And everything was stacked against me. You have no college degree. You have no professional experience. You're only 22. <laughs> like, yeah. And you're supporting the mid-market sales team. Everybody without experience would have to start on the small business sales team. But the mid-market sales team was a little bit more like prestigious, you know, bigger deals, yeah, bigger money. Yeah. yeah. And I'm like, I want that. You know, <laughs> this is the team I'm on. And they're like, well... You have to get your degree. You have to learn the sales profession. You're going to have to start out in small business. You're going to have to excel there and like maybe wait for a spot to be open on the mid-market team. And it was pretty stubborn back then. And I said, oh, wait. Strong-willed. Strong-willed. Strong-willed back then. And I said, no, I'm going to be on the mid-market team. And so I made myself determined, like I was determined to learn the sales profession. So I asked my sales manager, like, who's the best to learn from? And he said, Brian Tracy and Dale Carnegie. Mm -hmm. So I enrolled in the Dale Carnegie, how to sell like a pro classes, but I got the psychology of selling on cassette tape. Brian yeah. Tracy was an 11 cassette tape series. And I was driving a Dodge Durango back then, you know, in 2006. And it had the cassette player in it. And yeah. every time I drove, I listened to these on repeat, just like you and Zig Ziglar to where I was repeating and reciting oh, Brian cool. Tracy's stories, speaking similarly to him and so impactful on my life and teaching yeah. me the profession of sales before I ever sold anything. And then coupling that with Dale Carnegie. Yes. I went back to school. You guys know the story and was getting my degree online and was able to get that opportunity to go into mid-market sales. And it's not by coincidence that within my first 30 days, I became the number one rep. And I haven't looked back in my sales career, but the the leadership that was coming through those tapes and just into my life and showing me something new, because I grew up in the performing arts. I, I grew up in, a, in anything but corporate mm, yeah. is what I was exposed to. And then those four very dark years between age 18 and 22 before I stumbled upon corporate America. Mm -hmm. I was in like the bar scene and club scene. And like, I mean, I was like as gone as someone can be gone as far from corporate America as you can be. So for me to learn something like that through a tape, I mean, these are transformative. And I think it inspired, you know, now that you're saying, I think it inspired both of us. I never realized until I heard your story, how impactful that was for me. And maybe subconsciously yeah. part of my love for being on the stage and speaking and authoring books, like that might be kind of stemming from how transformative that was in my life. I never even thought about it, but cool story. So well, then what did Very you do? Cool. So it reminds me of a, um, a mutual friend of you and I uh, in Nashville, Rory Vaden says you're most powerfully positioned to serve the person you once were. were. Yeah. Like, hello. Mm -hmm. But yeah, that's what that's Zig good. showed me. That's what yeah. Brian Ch Tracy showed yeah, you, right? Yeah. You're right. Yeah. Well, mine was this giant, you know, you're pounding your chest. My, I, I was there too, but <laughs> the main driver for me or the outward facing version maybe of that was I'm going to show, I'm going to prove the world wrong. Yeah. I'm not some white trash kid from the, the trailer park, the trailer park, <laughs> yeah. Castle Rock. Like, yeah. um, and I was the first, I was, I, I went to school. Um, I found this building outside. It said um, student aid mm -hmm. and they gave away free money. <laughs> and I just kept going back in and they would give me checks and I, and they would clear and I'd be like, this <laughs> is, is amazing. This? <laughs> this is the path to wealth right here. <laughs> student aid. That's good. That's so good. worked my way through school and, and got student loans and my parents helped every way that, that mm -hmm. they could financially as well. Um, decided, okay, well, Hey, look, like, uh, I didn't know the term socioeconomic, but I, I was wanting out of the socioeconomic position that we were in. I was going to bring mom mm -hmm. with me, right? That yeah. was the goal and mm -hmm. not healthy by the way, in hindsight. Um, so I, I go, well, let me get into the business school. How do you get into the business school? Well, you, you, you gotta know a heck of a lot more than, you know, Brent. Right. Like, so I start working and applying. It takes three applications, three semesters to finally get accepted from the arts and science into the business school. I'm up at CU. And then I'm in, I'm in the business school. I'm like, well, what degrees are available in the business school? And literally this is how I chose. Like, mm -hmm. I'm like, everyone says finance is the hard one. Like, okay, then let's do that. Like, I'll take that. As long as they keep giving me those checks in that other pretty building over there, like, let's try it. Wow, I'm so impressed. I'm, I'm in my senior year about to graduate. I get an offer um, at a really high end uh, wealth management firm mm -hmm. here in, in Denver. And um, I begin interning and then get offered a job as I graduate. And, uh, you know, I start by learning how to answer the phones yeah, and how to file and then how to do paperwork. Did and you fax anything? I love, I still think faxes 
are amazing. I remember the first time I was asked to send a fax and I said there at the fax machine and I picked up the phone off the side. <laughs> Like, what do you mean, hello? <laughs> do I say the number? Why is there a handset? Well, I don't know, but it was real. there. <laughs> it's like, what do I do with this? Yeah. Vaccine is cool. Remember, you know, how does that piece of paper go through that wire <laughs> 20 miles away to the office I'm faxing it okay. to? I still think it's amazing. Do you remember those Valentines with the candy hearts that are absolutely disgusting? Yeah. They used Chalk. like, if some used to say, fax me on there. Did you know that? Really? Like, yeah, like, call me, fax me. Like, I had a fax me on the heart. <laughs> Go here's, love my, here's my pager. <laughs> Let's connect. <laughs> okay. Moving on. So uh, yes, you yeah. got to do. So that's how I started. So, um, the guy who <laughs> I was mentoring directly under the founder and CEO of the firm, he chose me, like picked me out. Like that's the kid. I had no idea why or yeah. where it was coming from. And, uh, he groomed me in that business and I began producing, producing at a really high level. I was Jeez. generating high, high income yeah. before I was 30. And um, he, I knew he was um, a very polarizing figure. I'm trying to be polite here. A lot of people that don't appreciate him. Okay. And, and he's done. I, I never thought he would do it to me mm -hmm. um, until, I, until I was trying to leave the firm. So uh, when it was time to leave, um, I, I was 33. I did it poorly. Um, and I had made some mistakes. Yeah. He, he was just, I've given a TED Talk on this. And um, so I spilled my guts there. So I don't need to go into the dirty details. But um, as I'm leaving, trying to leave, he took something that I take full ownership for, foolishly had like withheld information from him mm -hmm. personally, like a personal account, not a business or clients or any of that. Um, but it was enough when I left, he could use it to come after me and say, I think there's more. What? Right. Yeah. So come um, on, man. I began, he, he came after me legally, um, um, financially income went away overnight when I left, um, relationally that dude burned up the phone lines, calling clients, vendors, neighbors, my family. And he's so good at, manipulation in his words, he would say, look, we just don't know how big this is, but I just wanted to let you know that Brent, essentially Brent's out there and he's on the loose. So just beware if he calls you and tries to convince you to give him money or like he's saying, people are like, it gives them the ick, right? So your name. Yeah. Went. Well, Damn. and then I, I think the whole world is coming down on me now in hindsight, looking back, like, I think I was giving myself way too much credit. People, <laughs> right? People don't think that much about Brent, um, the way that Brent thinks that they do. Well, it, I, to say it was scary times, I, I can't, is be an understatement. The legal side wasn't just a, from a compliance perspective, but literally legal, like went to our broker dealer. Then he went to, um, he literally filed something with the U.S. attorney here in Denver to say, I mean, that was like the Bernie Madoff era. So he's like, this guy may be up to something you should probably investigate. And by the way, he can say that and there's no downside to him. You know what I mean? Like right. if he's wrong, he's like, well, sorry, I'm just, I'm, I'm such a good Samaritan. I just wanted to make sure like, <laughs> so it's the, the definition of a bully, right? Like whatever they say you're doing, they're probably doing, or he's mm -hmm. bullying you until you punch back. Right. And then he runs to the teacher and says, he hit me. Mm -hmm. Yes. It's that. So um, I, I, my, our life is coming down. Grayson's five, Lily's three. Amy's like emotionally, like in the fetal position under her desk at home. Like, I don't know where we're going next. My identity, we can go there later, was stripped. Like how I viewed myself in the world and what I had gotten to through you lost your edge. Arch and, and Zig Ziglar and getting into the B school. And then it's gone. So I'm defending myself with a high end attorney at, I think, $700 an hour mm -hmm. without income. It doesn't take many weeks of being in front of him at $700 an hour before you're out of money. And then I, you begin selling things in the house. Yeah. I like know. You, you sell. Like, I've been here. Yeah. So uh, thank, they go through this. I come under investigation. They, they rip your guts out and put it under a microscope. By the way, their job isn't to be reasonable and be like, oh, this is probably not that. There's no, no pragmatism. they're assuming the absolute worst here. They're, looking for yeah. they're paid to find something that they can right. hammer you with. Um, thank God 
uh, you know, the case gets dropped and there's no I'm sorry or there's no like, hey, are you going to call those dozens of people that know me that you crapped on me in front Mm -hmm. of? Yes. To tell them you were wrong? No. You can control what you can control. So um, to make matters worse, um, that guy that did that to me is also my father-in-law. That's waiting for the punchline. There it is. I knew it. That's the uh, ick. That's the most people are like, oh, you know, like, yeah, trust me. I grabbed the wastebasket a lot in those days. Um, Yeah. No wonder your wife was in the fetal position, how that happens to her family. Yeah. Coming from her own bloodline. Right. On that is. Crazy complicated, right? (laughs) Like a therapist could have a heyday. (laughs) Amy made a comment to someone else that I overheard later saying in those dark days, one of the two men in my life was evil because her head's spinning. Like the bomb just went off. Her ears are ringing. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know she was taking a step back and watching me and then taking a step back and watching her dad to make a decision as to which one of these two is lying through his teeth. (sighs) Right. So it's terrible. I feel so badly for her. Um, and she, she, she didn't have any way to defend herself from mm-hmm. this. This was a, right. She just vulnerable. Right. At every level. Um, it was during that time that, you know, I had grown up uh, in a Christian home. I got, I was saved at 11. Wasn't exactly living it out. <laughs> um, I had fire Christians insurance don't. about it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That, yeah. Um, fire insurance. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> um, and uh, Amy had grown up Catholic, but had accepted Christ formally um, her senior year in high school when we met. And I had said some things to her and she was like, I've never heard this. And then we snuck out, snuck her out of her parents' house to go to her grandmother's home, who was out of town. We knew the house was empty to have a phone call with my dad because um, my dad is a deacon in his church and this crazy strong believer. Mm-hmm. And we have a phone call together, like a secret society phone call <laughs> about Jesus. Yeah. Oh. And then he led her through s- salvation and oh. he said, are you, are you, do you want to do that? And she said, I did that last, I've already done that. And you, he does this like audible exhale. He's like, Oh, when? And she's like, well, Brent started mentioning these things to me. And Aww. he had said, and I did it alone in my bedroom one night. So like, you don't have to be Tim Tebow. You don't have to be Franklin Graham. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like you can you plant seeds everywhere. You don't have to hit people over the head with their Bible. No. Um, I sure, surely wasn't. I probably couldn't have found my Bible. Um, wow. So uh, when we're going through this dark time, Amy and I immediately go running back to God. Mm-hmm. Right. I'm like bloodied i feel bloodied like i feel flat on my face like mud missing teeth oh, I can't blood even. you know like i'm feeling just beat down yeah i just I literally like could i just will myself to die yeah. if there wasn't you know grayson and lily and amy like i literally would just want to like just i can i just this be over and we stumble into we start going to churches and you want to meet some freaks start church shopping yeah <laughs> There's some weirdos out there. <laughs> There's a couple who were like, we're, we were there like 15 minutes and I'm like, we need to leave. Like, like the Pentecostal. We're like, like- we go to the daycare, like get the kid. We need the kids back, please. <laughs> like go out the closest door and run to the car church and lock is it. different than what I'm used to. Yeah. So um, we finally, we found our church. And when we did, it wasn't the type of church. It wasn't the size of church I was looking mm-hmm. for. But we sat down and we heard... Uh, and again, right, it's personal. When I sat down and I heard Jim Dixon teach from the stage that day, I was like, that's my pastor. Yes. This is my church. Yes. And I, we walked out and I was like, please, Amy, I hope you liked this one. Mm-hmm. And we get in the car and she starts tearing up. Oh, it was wow. Obvious. <laughs> this is it. So um, my kids then, we go to school there. We send the kids to school there. Amy gets a job at working for the church in the counseling department. Uh I'm volunteering all the time. I'm Mm -hmm. teaching. I begin teaching financial literacy. We're building the foundation. Like 
we're the alternative to you know who out of Nashville, like <laughs> yeah. in the church, the church world. Um, both of my kids accept Christ each when they're each in the fifth grade. Wow, Mary, I don't know if that would have happened if yeah. I would not have had the situation burn my life yeah. to the ground, mm-hmm. right? Like, and I've, there's so much guilt that I still feel to this day for having run down this money and things and proving the world wrong. I know. I mean, I. I pull up in the Rover and I got the $15,000 watch on, uh, but my kids aren't saved. Yeah. You're really winning, Brent. Yeah. I'm glad I'm not alone. (laughs) Sorry. Hopefully we end on a higher note than than this. (laughs) (laughs) Oh gosh. But it's a reality. A lot of Christians face. I mean, this is why we have this fearless faith radio show because it is unique to be a woman or man of faith and to have marketplace talents and to be working inside of corporate America or in the marketplace in general. And it's something that I would cry out to God and ask him, why did you create me this way? When I became a woman of faith and I gave my life to the Lord, the way that he changed my life and he saved me from the the hell, hell, hell I was living in all the different ways, shapes, and forms that I had endured. And the fact that it could change so rapidly and be such a free present and gift for my life There were so many days where I could just feel this pull in my heart. Like, I just want people to know. I want them to know. I don't want the Lord to be my best kept secret. Mm -hmm. But my days were filled with sales roles and entrepreneurship and CEO roles and building and scaling companies. And there was so much distraction and so much work that would just edge out the Lord and edge out my God time and push it to the side. And I would build these empires over and over and over again. And the Lord would tear them down and it would cause me to be on my knees, literally. And yes, there are several times I remember thinking to myself, you know, praying out, like I'm at the end of myself. I have nothing left to give Lord. You could take my life. But there were two times specifically where the prayer was very real very, very begging, take my life. I don't want to go another day where I had just felt like one was pre-Christ and one was with Christ. These two moments in my life where I felt by my, by the work of my own hands and the selfishness and pride in my own heart that I had built something that felt so, so that felt so self-serving in the time. And it was so anti-Christ And it became my own idol in my own life of what I was worshiping. And I had done it just again last year. And when you and I had our infamous coffee, oh, wait, 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 you guys, audience, remember this coffee I've told you about a billion times where I was crying in Starbucks last summer with Brent? This is Brent. (laughs) The poor guys had to see too many tears. So I'm sitting... And I'm crying at this table in Starbucks and real, like, what am I doing with my life? I was about to turn 40 years old and I've had more successes and worldly successes than most will ever have in a lifetime. And similar, I'm sitting, I'm like, what do I have to show for this at this moment in time? Success comes and goes, titles come and go, money comes and goes. But at the core, like, what do I have left in my life? Because what I have left, which is the rock, which is Jesus Christ, is all that is worth my time and energy to spread the news of that. But I have realized But he's not taking away these marketplace talents. He's not taking away the placement and the assignment and turning my work into my ministry. But I'm sitting here like, how do I do this? Mm. How do I take this platform and learn how to honor the Lord in my work? And it has just put me on this journey of so much soul searching to ask him, why did you create me? And it's so clearly written in Ephesians that he created me on purpose, intentionally for this time with these talents, with these gifts for a time such as this to do good works with him in partnership with him and to further the kingdom. He has put me in the marketplace specifically for this. He's put you in the marketplace specifically for this to further the kingdom. And he's given us all a very unique way of doing that. But it causes and it requires us to be so centered on him fully. And he is such a good father that when we build our own little enterprises and towers and idols, that he will tear them down for us and take us down to that moment where we have nothing left. And this is a common occurrence in my life. And I wish I could tell you that each time it happens, I'm just like so much smarter and wiser. And I'm like, I shall never build another tower and idol again. Like, but on this side of heaven, while we are living in a in the fallen world, the flesh and the desires and the temptations and the enemy constantly 
attempting to steal, kill, and destroy and take what is good in my life, it's going to be a constant battle that I have every day. And it's just taking being centered on him. So this is why we have this show. This is a very real, honest story. And I think that so many people can resonate with your walk Mm. and they're most likely experiencing something similar where they're realizing who are the idols? What is the idol in my life right now? What am I worshiping? What am I putting my dependence on my livelihood and my future on? If it is not on the word of God and the rock and foundation of Christ in your life, then you're worshiping the wrong thing. You're focusing on the wrong thing. Your story is a true testament to that in the work. On that note, hey audience, I'm going to take us into a super short break. We'll be right back. Every leader must learn how to connect with those that follow. Your story is the proving ground for real content that connects with your audience and moves them to action. Creator Spark is a proud sponsor of Fearless Faith Radio. To claim your free leadership content strategy session, visit creatorspark.com slash fearless faith. You are ready to transform your workplace and look no further than PNI HCM, your partner in building and maintaining the experiences your employees deserve. At PNI HCM, they take pride in offering cutting edge payroll and HR solutions designed to streamline your people operations from recruitment to retirement. PNI HCM is your partner in creating a remarkable employee experience that boosts engagement, productivity, and your bottom line. In a world where only 33% of the workforce is engaged, choosing the right human capital management technology is crucial. PNI HCM isn't just a solution, we're your strategic ally. With PNI HCM, you're not just adopting technology, you're embracing a culture of belonging, appreciation, and longevity. Because when your workforce thrives, so does your organization. If you are ready to save time and elevate your employee experience, visit www.pnihcm.com now. And let us show you why we're the driving force behind successful workplaces. Welcome back to the Fearless Faith Radio Show. I'm your host, Very Grothy. I'm having way too much fun today with a very special friend of mine, our guest today, Brent Hines, who's the executive um, director, I almost said founder, but I'm sure you can be that too, because you did found it, executive founder director at the Foundation for Financial Wellness. And as we wind down in our show today, I would love to hear more specifically about the work you're doing and how people can get involved in that. You have so many different ways at the consumer level, the employer level, the certified financial wellness ed- educator and counselor level, like the people that are coming together from the community with these skills and talents who take your program, they get certified, they deliver the content, they they counsel people. I mean, it's just an unbelievable program. So if you can just talk about the work and share with us what you're doing in there, that would sure. be great. Yeah, love to. Yeah, this this all ends up creating this thing I would have never come up with on my own um, yeah. for, for, th- through these experiences. Um, we end up creating a 501c3 uh, educational nonprofit called the Foundation for Financial Wellness. Um, I end up going back to my roots in Houston and walking into some em- this employer called NASA, yeah. <laughs> of all things, Johnson Space Center. Um, and they were going through massive layoffs when the space shuttle program went away. And they were like essentially our first c- customer. <laughs> Yeah. Nothing like the deep end. Yeah. Um, so the big logo to get on your first, it wasn't a bad logo. Round. It wasn't, you know, they, <laughs> they call it the, the uh, meatball. Um, yeah, you can yeah. see it right in your mind. Yes. So, uh, yeah. And you gotta be really careful how you use it too. And they made that clear when we started, Yeah. but we started, um, teaching and we started in the financial literacy space. Mm-hmm. But then when I began, uh, overlaying these concepts, like from Zig and from John Wittry with the, yes. you have, and the Rory Vaden's of my life, I didn't know Rory yet then, but Um, We overlaid be, do, have on top of finance and and we came up with beliefs, behaviors, and systems. That's the be, do, have version of finance. And then we end up creating the financial operating system, which is (laughs) trademark pending. I can't believe that wasn't trademarked. Yeah, good for you. Yep. So um, the process is built on values and vision, which are so powerful. Right. They're your values. This makes it personal. No one can tell Mm -hmm. you if your values are right or wrong. They're yours. You don't get to. Like, these are my values. And vision is bigger than goals. Uh, it's life and legacy. Mm-hmm. And then you put your behaviors, uh, I'm sorry, beliefs, behaviors, and systems on top of those two pillars. Okay. Values, That's visions, the ecosystem. beliefs, behaviors, systems. You okay. got it. Okay. You got it. Um, so we teach around that model and we begin teaching at the work site and then we begin building an online system and then we build a, count, a one-on-one private counseling program. Mm-hmm. 
And then the lady who ran the wellness program at NASA, she loses all good judgment and puts in her resignation to join the crazy train and help us build this. She's tremendous too. She's crazy. She is. She's a crazy person. She yeah. has. Like, in all the wonderful ways that you would use that term. Yeah. She, she would. <laughs> she's still with us today. She'll be with us till day last. Um, <laughs> she would lay in traffic for us, especially me. Um, and it has not <laughs> paid off yet. In my opinion, why? Like you're leaving NASA. Yeah, I know the paycheck, the, the retirement, like all the, it, all the benefits to get behind to come build something that doesn't exist in an industry that doesn't exist yet. Right. Real, oh, wait, I thought you were supposed to be smart. You're the rocket science. Yeah. That wasn't smart, Karen. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, we built a counseling program at Karen's direction. She goes, Hey, in the, in the wellness world, we have these things called interventions. We need to build one for the finance. So mm. we built one on one private counseling. Who's going to deliver the counseling. We need a gold standard a system for how yes. do we screen people to come in that have the right heart and head. Absolutely. Yep. I mean, and anointing to do that work is that is a very special talent to love people it at is. that level and it's to like, like love them in truth, not love, not trying to sell product. Well, uh, absolutely. Just at the core is a human. Yes. Yeah. Yes. It's a, much like a first responder yeah. or a counselor, right? Mm -hmm. Like when Amy worked in the counseling department, I would go, how in the world are they training you on how to leave this at the office? Mm. Like you're, you're like a firefighter. You're running into burning buildings. Yes. People come in and bad things happen all the time. Like I, she would come and tell me, I'm like, oh, la, 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 I can't listen to this. Mm -hmm. Especially when it has to do with kids. Like, Bad stuff happens. Yes. So yeah, to lean in to people and like really be there for them and be one of maybe one of the first times a true expert has listened and then provided a, a process, a model to follow. And then it's like, no, stay engaged. I feel like that's step number one of, is aligning with the person and meeting them where they are. Like if right. you look at Jesus's ministry and how he was meeting the exact need of the person where they were. He, he, he was able to connect with them at a level that caused them just immediately to feel that connection, humility, and to be seen for who they were and where they were. Yeah. And he met them right there. And in that connection, once he had their heart open, mm -hmm. he was able to minister and be able to deliver that wisdom that he is known for and to help educate and redirect, but from a place of love and only after he met them exactly where they were with no judgment. Yeah. I mean, just pure as pure as pure love as can be. And I love that in the program that you have, because there are some, a big notable name in the financial, like get out of debt and get yourself right with money industry. And I do feel like it is lacking some of that, like meet people where they are and identify because a lot has had to happen in order for them to be where they are right now. And what is going on in their mind, like you said, the six inches between their ears, but also the connection to their heart. Yeah. And when we look at our values and our vision, just the fact that you have that at the very ba like ba bottom word, thank you, Mary, at the bottom of this model of like, this is the foundation mm -hmm. and from there building on top of it. But for someone in your program to be able to meet that person exactly where they are, to understand what is formed to this point, what do they value? What is the vision? What is the belief, the current behaviors? And then what can we do in yeah. order to re rewire this and change it? I think it's transformative. I'm sorry, I have to say something else because I'm <laughs> super passionate about this. You said there's not an industry yet for this and there really wasn't for the, for the first 10 years, yeah. you and I were figuring out how to get anybody to give two hoots about this <sighs> thing in a way edge. that they were uh, like writing a check to have it. I'm like, this is, there's all the research. There's all the science. There's all the data. There's endorsements for the National Wellness Institute, which I know has changed names. There's, yeah. there's a rocket scientist on your team who is <laughs> building the content in the, in the trans theoretical behavior models yeah. and like Look absolutely. Dropping that. That was a big word. That was nice. Nicely I won't done. spell it, but I will say it. The trans <laughs> But it's incredible to see what you've carved out and what you've done. And then a whole bunch of bad actors went out and said they have financial wellness mm. and they embedded some check the box educational materials inside of their financial products, like in retirement or in like, you know, Intuit has that 
uh, thing that you can connect all of your accounts and it tells you, I'm forgetting what it's called, Mint, you know, it's like telling you what your net worth is. And then you have these products out in the market who do like earned wage access that work with payroll companies and they give employees access to their pay inside of a pay period. So they don't have to wait to get their pay and they can access that money early. And then like, uh, like as soon as it's earned, they can get a percentage of their check paid to them. And then they have financial wellness inside of their product. <laughs> It is not financial wellness. So we are clear. Like then who on your team inside of the app reaches out to the individual, sits with them, meets them exactly where they are. They're the hands and feet and the love of Jesus, even though it's not a Christian ministry and it's not marked that way. And and so much of the greatness inside of the marketplace, like you said, you don't need to walk around beating people over the head with a Bible. That's not what this is. You are taking biblical foundational principles of loving people and loving your neighbor and acting just like the hands and feet of Jesus in his ministry. And you're meeting people where they are. And you are helping them to, for the potentially the first time in their life, understand money at a level that has never been put in front of them and rewiring their minds. And so that they can have the centered on the right values with the right vision and are unlocking so much wealth and legacy for their families. Like it's just truly tremendous. So I just get so fired up clearly and angry when people are like, my 401k advisor does the financial wellness for the company. They do. You mean when they do the annual meeting every year to talk about what retirement is and what the difference between 3% and 8% is and high risk versus moderate risk and what it looks like to manage your investments? Yeah. That's financial wellness, like get a life people. And I say that with love because it is a disservice to say that you do something and you are something that you're not. And anyway, I really like Brent's work. Uh, you may continue. <laughs> I don't know if I want to, but I love the way you defend us. Thank you. Um, I do. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so these, what we would call point solutions, right? Like I don't have anything against financial product. I don't have anything against FinTech. No. I love it. Just don't call financial wellness. Exactly. Thank you for clarifying that because there are some good partners out there. Sure. People I work with on a daily basis, because obviously I work at a payroll company yeah. and like I've embedded a lot of these FinTech solutions and, and, and products inside of the, yeah. the greater offering that we have. So in themselves, they're fine. Their vehicles, their, their, their products, they're great. But just please just don't say, oh, we have financial wellness because in, sorry, last comment, you have an HR director who's in charge of the body of their people in their company and they care. HR leaders care. There's, there's some of the most incredible people I've ever worked with. A big reason why I keep boomeranging back into this industry. They really can transform a company from the inside out. These are initiatives that are important to them, but when they are trying to get budget approved or something like this, or to put it in place, and then this is where we are banging our heads against the wall. just like, we already have financial wellness. <laughs> anyway, yeah. continue. Right. And they get it from both sides. Right. Up and down. Mm-hmm. Right. Uh, yeah. I, I have empathy for the HR director. Yeah, it's hard. Yeah. Very hard. Um, so obviously we look up today and we we have this offering um, that looks like other employee benefit offering, meaning in, in terms of how it fits, there's a mm-hmm. place for it in the corporate, in the corporate space now. Um, then we, we began learning that, hang on a second, there is tangible, measurable ROI to the employer who yes. invests in their employees' financial well-being. Of course. It, is, it was like, duh, I should have had a V8 moment. And we're like, well, how do we do this? Well, then we get introduced to a guy named Kent Allison, hmm. who is a partner at a little company called PricewaterhouseCoopers. That Small company. He created their financial wellness <laughs> business unit. <laughs> and then he's retiring in the middle of COVID. He's not even 60 years old yet. Huh. The way the formula works for their partners, you need to retire by 60. Mm. Um, so he has done incredibly well and he's not done. Yeah. Right. And then he begins interviewing other companies inside of the industry and he chooses a little old us to come sit on our executive board. So cool. Oh my goodness. And, and, and then Kent's like, no, this is the work I've been doing at PwC for years. The drivers to employ to the employer, we can lower healthcare costs. We can increase productivity. Remember measurably. Yes. Not just like a feel good no. or soft numbers, uh, absenteeism, presenteeism, utilization of the other benefits, which by the way, you're paying for. Mm-hmm. So yeah, not only do we have a place on the roster, we actually amplify the others. Yes. So all the 401k advisors and the the benefit brokers, like you should put us on your Christmas card list because <laughs> we're helping you get the message out. Where does your point solution fit in their total well-being? 
That's good. Right? Mm -hmm. So, uh, and there's a couple ways that we go to market. We can be a standalone program. Sure. And then this year, this is the final big news kind of advancement we're at in this point in time, if you will. Um, we are the first financial wellness program to ever be inside of a Section 125 cafeteria plan. This has never been done. So a Section 125 cafeteria plan is built for preventative care and wellness. If we really are financial wellness, we mean both words, don't we belong inside of a wellness plan? Yes. That's exactly where we live. Yeah, that was a game changer. Um, you yeah. were you sent me an email when we were on our way to Casa Bonita, and I'm in the front seat. It was a humble brag there, of the truck. It? Yeah, I was on the list. I got my invite. Uh, it was our. It was like an amazing night for the family to go out, and I get this email from Brent, like breaking news, breaking news. We're going to be put inside of a Section 125 tax savings wellness plan. I'm like, what? This changes everything, yeah. everything. And I remember calling him while we were driving to Casa Bonita. I'm sure you know what it is. I don't care where you live. You got to know what Casa Bonita if is. If you raise the red flag, you if, know what it if is. You, if you go to my Instagram, you could see my highlight from that evening. It was back in May and we had like all the cliff divers and the excitement and all the baskets of sopa pias. And, mm. Okay. But anyway, the Section 125 Tax Savings Wellness Plan allows this unbelievable financial wellness product and service to be delivered at no cost to an employee, no cost to an employer. And through the brilliant workings of the way section 125 tax savings plans work, there's a pre-tax deduction that comes out of an employee's paycheck with a post-tax reimbursement that gets booked within the same period. And what that does is it offsets not only the cost of the premium to have access to these preventative and also wellness, um, providers, but it <laughs> creates a net positive savings in their paycheck. It's unbelievable how these have been built. And I think they honor the American worker who historically have not had access to these types of insurance products or programs. And not only do they get it at no cost, they actually get a bump in their paycheck, 50, 75, $100, just depends. And then the employer gets the FICA tax savings because of the pre-tax deduction that's happening on the employee. We were running a census for our clients and we were able to map out like in a pro forma type way, like what by employee, what is this going to put back in their paycheck? And as an employer, what is the annual savings? Brent, what were we seeing? I mean, some of them were like, like 150 employees and it was 77,000 of employer savings and employer savings on FICA tax savings. Like, and like, we're sitting here and we're like, well, we used to have trouble selling this because <laughs> people couldn't find budget to yeah. allocate to something so wonderful and so powerful. Now we're telling them not only is it no cost, but they're getting money back. And then they're like, we can't buy this because it's too good to be true. I'm like, oh my gosh. Okay. What do we do? But we've been yeah. on a journey together in the last couple of months, just bringing this to market and helping enlighten employers uh, to say, and, and really what we found is the employer is like blown away by it, but it really does belong to be a part of the employee benefits conversation with the brokers. And so we've been opening those doors and meeting with health insurance brokers and just being like, oh my gosh, this is just mind blowing. I mean, some of these plans are, are full MEC plan, minimal employee coverage or essential coverage for the employees, which work against the mandates, you know, to make sure that's all satisfied. And there's just truly remarkable, remarkable products coming to market. And I, I'm, you know, I'm pumped up. I'm, I'm jazzed about it. That may have been over the, the head for some people listening, but the right person's listening to that and going <laughs> like, uh, can we please learn more? We need this. Uh, yeah, pretty impressive. Yeah. yeah. Our biggest sales hurdle now is what's the catch? I know. <laughs> I'll take that problem. Like that's a good problem to have. It but is. It is. It's so guess what? We go back to our roots and we start educating, mm -hmm. which is it's, what we've done from the start it, absolutely. and encouraging people now, employers to take action. Mm-hmm. That's exactly right. It's exactly yeah. right. Oh my gosh. Link all of our neighbors, every American worker, all of our neighbors that are underinsured, uninsured, don't have access to yeah. the real wellness that can change their lives. Like when you're financially well, what happens inside of your family, inside of your marriage, your wealth, your legacy, reducing your stress? Stress is the thing that triggers like heart disease and obesity and other yeah. factors, headaches, migraines, like the things inside of your body and your nervous system and other systems inside of your body, like don't do well with high cortisol levels, which are directly caused by stress. And 
the number one cause of stress is financial stress. So it's like when you go back to the core, this is one of the most remarkable things I've ever stood behind. It's such an honor to learn about it. What else did you want to say on the work before I ask you the final question? Uh, when I name dropped earlier, Ken Allison, um, yeah. <laughs> uh, the, the humble brag there, uh, Kent is running right now. It's not, we haven't run the study yet, but we are running an employee impact study. Mm -hmm. And the hypothesis is that we can directly tie financial well being to health outcomes. Yeah. When we make that direct line correlation, mm -hmm. it's going to blow the lid off of employee benefits and all the good that's going to come. Like at the end of the day, it's got to be about people. And then yes. how that then cascades to the employer who's going to be like, kick open the door, come mm -hmm. in, give us some of that. Yeah. Right. So, it's huge, Brent. Yeah, big, it's huge. Exciting times right now. My gosh, even just thinking about like when people are financially stressed and then they go hit the bottle. Yeah. Like they want to drink their woes away. Well, what does that turn into? I mean, just thinking about all the triggers. Tylenol cells. <laughs> oh, you weren't. Uh. Not that bottle. Um, <laughs> oh, that in the morning. Yeah. Understood. Yeah. Understood. I was slow. Okay. I was slow. I'm getting it now. Well, thank you so much for sharing all of that. I have to ask you the last question, okay. which is what is your advice for our audience on how to have fearless faith from my experience and which leads to my bias <laughs> i lean heavily on identity Ooh. so my identity as a kid was that of poor white trash prove the world wrong then my identity turned into i'm the first kid in our family to go to college mm. then it turned into i'm in the business school mm -hmm. then it turned into I'm a high-end financial advisor. Yes. And then that got blown up overnight and I'm under attack. And I begin thinking through, why is this so painful to me? The identity part yeah. is extremely painful. So painful. So we run through, a, we have an exercise that we do when we, especially when we teach in person, that's extremely popular and it's called role versus soul. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. what we're really doing is comparing all the roles in life to the true you, role versus soul. Yeah. So where do you find your identity? Mm -hmm. Now, it's one thing to say it or hear it on Sunday morning. It's another thing to really live it. If you begin listing the roles you play in life, you play a lot of roles. Mm -hmm. you, you are, a, you're a, a wife, you're a mother, you're a, you're a business executive. Yes. Uh, you're a Christian, you're a neighbor, you're a friend, you're yeah. right. You start listing all these things and you're like, Okay. Uh, one of the other roles that we play, whether you like it or not, or, or think about it or not, is that of financial stewardship. One of my roles is dealing with my money. Mm -hmm. So take some pressure off how you deal with your money, even though that's what, that's my life and my life's work now mm -hmm. is not who you are. Yeah. So what you do is not who you are. And in Mary and I's case, what you did yeah. is not who you are. Amen. Yeah. That's good, Brent. I'm taking a deep breath on that one to let it soak in. Like the fearlessness in that and the faith in that is believing at the core that our faith in Jesus Christ and who he is in our life and the identity that he has given us as a creation of him, created in his image, intentionally on purpose for this time right now as we are, created with a dependence on him for a fruitful life and the promises that he gives us and how he will provide and the promises and the action steps that we can take in being stewards of everything that comes through to us. But having that rooted in the identity as his son or daughter supersedes anything that we could give ourselves in the title and the various journeys and chapters <laughs> that we have in our own lives. Okay. This was incredible episode. I'm so grateful for, for you. This me. is probably super long overdue, but yeah. I know all in God's timing, this is perfect. I think the message today with a lot of the advancements that have happened with the foundation, this was good timing because yeah, this perfect. is where I feel like we're just like, it's like, here. Yeah. Ah, it's so yeah. close. Yeah. Uh, with that, how do people get in touch with you or learn more about the foundation? Come to our website, foundationforfinancialwellness.org. Uh, tons of offerings here, tons of free resources. Um, if you are a little, little sh shameless plug here, mm -hmm. if you do represent an employer or you want to take us to your employer, we'd love to, that's, those are the conversations we're having right now. That's yes. how we're touching as many people as possible mm -hmm. is getting us embedded inside of the employee benefit mix. So 
Okay, great. And then Brent Hines, H I N E S. Every time you said hindsight, I was like, <laughs> oh, whoa, there's funny. a play there. There is a play there. I know it's spelled differently, obviously, but yeah, mm-hmm. hindsight. Yeah. Um, you can find him on LinkedIn. You can follow him there. And I just want to say thank you so much for joining us today. Yeah, thanks for having me. All right. For our audience, thank you for tuning in to another week of the Fearless Faith Radio Show. Be sure to catch all the former episodes, fearlessfaithradio.com. You can also find them on video on my YouTube channel at Mary Grothy. If you're listening on a platform like Apple or Spotify, it would be so meaningful if you could please rate and review the show that helps us reach more people. Thank you all so much. And we'll see you next week. That's it for today's episode of Fearless Faith. Be sure to connect with me, Mary Grothy, G-R-O-T-H-E, on all social platforms and to learn more about my keynote speaking and other ways to work with me at marygrothy.com.